Welcome to the Wade Center's podcast. A podcast of Wheaton College. I'm Dr. Crystal Downing, and I am here with Dr. David Downing. We are the co-directors of the Marion E. Wade Center. And with us today is the Reverend Dr. Malcolm Geit, who teaches in the Faculty of Divinity at the University of Cambridge, where he also serves as chaplain of Girton College. Dr. Geit has published five books of poetry, um, several books on Christian faith and theology, and performs as singer and guitarist for the rock band Mystery Train. We're delighted to have him here with us. He is interested in uh, the authors here at the Wade Center, especially C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, and Owen Barfield. So, David has the first question for you. Um, thanks for joining us, Malcolm. Uh, I, we could have actually a podcast with Malcolm the Poet, or Malcolm the Scholar, <laughs> or Malcolm the Priest, or Malcolm the Musician. I think this would be for Malcolm the Priest. I'm interested in your conversion experience. A biographical a sketch that I have says that you were doing a study of the Psalms and you had a, a kind of an epiphany or a conversion experience. Could you amplify a bit on that experience? Uh, yes, it's, it's <laughs> very kind to grace it as a study of the Psalms. It wasn't a study <laughs> at all. It was a, it was more of a kind of series of implications. No, I was I came, I was a sort of atheist shading into agnostic when I came up to to study English literature at, at Cambridge uh, in 1977. Um, but I soon found myself drawn to medieval literature, and even in the re Renaissance period, to to poets like Spencer. So there was a, obviously they were strongly Christian, and I, I began to read um, a certain amount of theology as background, allegedly background mm -hmm. to uh, to literature. You know, at the advice of my um, my tutors, so I read Augustine's Confessions and. Uh, uh, Bernard on the Song of Songs, but we also had a paper called the English Moralists in those days, which was <laughs> so most of them were neither English nor moralists, but that's <laughs> what they were called. So English Moralists consisted of you know Plato, Aristotle, you know Saint Paul, Boethius, and you could go on you know as far as Goethe if you liked. But uh, I was really I, I did Plato and Aristotle and and Saint Paul and Boethius, so I was getting a great deal of of challenge to my atheism, and also. Uh, just being moved by the poetry very deeply. So um, I could probably say with Lewis that um, my my imagination was baptized before I was, you know, and the, and the rest of me just took a little mm -hmm. bit longer to catch up. But at that point, I was trying to have my cake and eat it too. That is to say, I was trying to say, well, while I'm reading great Christian poetry, Christianity can be symbolically true for me. It can make a certain amount of psychological sense, and it's a system of symbols. It doesn't have to be grounded in any kind of fact, and it it's aesthetically glorious, but it makes no kind of moral demands on me so i can as it were live it vicariously mm. through these great christian poets but sort of turn it off whenever i need to i think i'd read um actually lewis quotes it somewhere but um uh, it's from the theologia germania i think lewis got it from williams the phrase every man is the atom of his own soul mm -hmm. so i was reading milton as a kind of psychological drama that there is a paradise in us, that there is a fault. So I was doing all that. But meantime, it made no impact on any of the challenges of life or sex and drugs or rock and roll or anything like that. You know, it could... So I would have probably carried on like that with God as a useful idea to me when I chose to turn him on, um, which is an awful way to live. But, you know, it's, uh, uh, until this occasion happened when I was reading the book of Psalms, not as a study, but actually I was feeling very disconsolate and angry and of course there's a lot of dissonance just between the way i was imaginatively bathing in christianity but practically ignoring it and still clinging to a, a sort of material philosophy anyway i got myself into a very bad place emotionally i was feeling very angry and i'd got into the habit of finding texts to express my feelings you know i'd ransack shakespeare for what i felt like so i sort of discovered that the book of psalms had these great psalms of imprecation and anger mm. and i was actually more or less shouting into an empty room one of these angry psalms just to give vent to anger just because it was such a powerful expression of of anger and suddenly i became aware that i was not alone in the room and that the one mm. to whom the mm. psalms are addressed 
by the psalmist had it was there and it wasn't mm-hmm. actually at all a kind of you know happy or or um you know consoling experience on the contrary i mean it was very dramatic it was like you know one minute i'm in the middle of the room alone and as one is you know the very fact that you look out of eyes in your own head means that you can't help physically seeing the world as being in concentric rings around you you know you are necessarily the center of your own perceiving and that very easily gets shifted into the th- absurd thought that you're the center of everything mm. and what the immediate effect of the presence of god sudden presence of god in the room was was utterly to shift that perspective i suddenly realized i was not only not the center but that the center this glorious holy center was filling the room and i didn't belong in anywhere near this center mm. and i felt myself dangling there from a tiny thread to the edge of this thing utterly contingent uh, you know tiny dependent before this other and um I mean, sometime later, I I read that passage in Isaiah 6, you know, about in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord Mm -hmm. lifting his his train filled the temple. There's no room for anything else. And, you know, of course, Isaiah says, woe is me. He doesn't say, oh, wow, I've had a religious experience. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll start a cult in California. He (laughs) he, he says, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. And that was my experience, that I I was sort of dangling from a thread. So that stayed. You know, it was kind of haunting. It was actually... And I tried, of course, to explain it away and, you know you know, that it was a flashback from some recreational substance or something. (laughs) But actually, I knew it wasn't. And eventually, you know, the last act of desperation of a Cambridge student, I finally went to see my chaplain, and who was a very wise man. And he said, well, I think the key to this is that you were reciting the Psalms and you were taking God's name in vain reciting the Psalms. So now you have this unavoidable presence the only thing that was make this present so is you must recite the Psalms. So he said, I said, I say morning and evening prayer, come to chapel. But he did an interesting thing. He forbade me. He positively forbade me to say the Gloria with him at the end of the Psalms, you know, mm. the glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. And he said, I'm sure you could spout some theology about the Son and the Spirit, but you have no knowledge of these things. Just speak to the Father. And so I began to say the Psalms. And actually, then when I took the Psalms, now with somebody to say them to, and Mm. began to go through the Psalter, I found that deeply satisfying, deeply moving. And I took the, you know, I felt I could say this, that this other one, this holy one, to whom I could not possibly address, had now given me the words with which to address him. Um, And so I kind of carried on like that for some time. And then eventually um, uh, the penny dropped, as it were, the other parts of the the picture, most specifically when I, I went to hear a Franciscan friar uh, called Eric Doyle, who's died now with a, a friend of mine, um, who who was talking. Uh, he was actually he wasn't preaching for conversion or anything. He was just talking about the Eucharist, and he he started talking about how um, completely a young child depends on its mother or on its parents. You know, the babe obviously in the womb on the umbilical cord, but you know, just born, it can't feed itself, it can't move, it can hardly even turn itself. All it can do is cry and hope to be heard. And I thought he was going to say. This is how we are with God. He is there fully in control. We are utterly, utterly dependent. I was expecting him to say that because that's exactly how I felt. And he said, oh, you're expecting me to say <laughs> this. <laughs> but he said, of course, not in the natural order, that's how we are with God. He's God and we're creatures. We're utterly dependent. We only exist because he's looking and breathing us into being. But that is, God knows that we can't, we can't be being we love each other from that height and depth. So God chooses to reverse the situation and he comes as the tiny baby and he's the one hanging on the umbilical cord and he's the one who could have been just kicked by the oxen or ignored by Mary and Joseph or as so many children were in the ancient world, just left exposed in. And he was completely defenseless. There was nothing he could have done to have stopped that. And he carries on being defenseless like that to us. And finally he comes and opens his arms on the cross for us and says, I'm not going anywhere. I'm utterly Mm. vulnerable to you. Mm -hmm. And somewhere while he was speaking, and then he finally said, at last he comes to you in this wafer. You know, Mm. I put this into your hand. You could spit on it. You could grind it under your feet. The one on whom you depend comes utterly dependent on you so that you can begin this relationship. And somewhere in the course of his saying that, the penny dropped. I thought, I get it. 
Mm. And I, I became a Christian, you know, then and there. And actually, for the first time in my life, I felt it was all right to be human. I mean, I'd always been haunted, as, you know, Lewis says he was at one point. I think in um, Problem of Pain, Lewis has a passage about how his imagination had been haunted by the idea of empty space, by the sheer mm. vastness of the cosmos, the sense of the trivial insignificance of this little blip on the edge of it. And um, that notion that God had become the tiniest of the blips in the little blip, I suddenly felt like really for the first time in my life that it was all right to be human. Mm -hmm. That it was, there was not something intrinsically inadequate about being a human being. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a great relief really. How old were you? Sorry, long, long answer to a short oh, question. How old were you at all. the time? I, so that was, um, that happened in the, uh, Autumn of 79, so I would have been just turning uh, 22. Mm. Uh, that's a very Lewisian uh, conversion story. He talks about uh, in Miracles, he critiques <laughs> uh, uh, pantheism just the way you did. That It's the kind of God that you can take off like a book off the shelf. Yeah. But he says that the human spirit is like concentric circles with the imagination on the outside and then the intellect in the middle yeah. and the will at the center. And it's surprised by joy. His imagination is baptized by George MacDonald. Yeah. And then his intellect is, um, Christianity is made plausible by talking. But finally, there's that someone that he has to yeah. uh, bow down Absolutely. to to become a Christian. So that conversion of the world, and that's more or less what happened to me because it was a series of poets, really, who'd baptized the imagination. Mm -hmm. The intellect, actually, it was a combination of Augustine and Boethius. Uh, reading Boethius's mm -hmm. Consolation mm -hmm. of Philosophy was a really important intellectual step for me. And then, of course, I began to reread Lewis. And... Um, Funny enough, the book that really gave me some theological grounding uh, from Lewis was not mere Christianity or even the allegorical, you know, even the, it was the preface to Paradise Lost. Mm. Mm. The chapter on Augustine and Augustine's mm. theology in the preface to Paradise Lost has never deserted me as, as, as mm. an account of good and evil and a, a sense of, of how God works in the cosmos, mm. you know. Um, well, that makes sense if you see various poets had baptized your imagination. So his discussion of this great poet, great poet of Christianity. Yeah. Um, which poets would you say baptized your imagination? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting question because I think it actually is my equivalent of the George MacDonald moment and the, the all transform, mm -hmm. the one text that suddenly changes the way you see everything. Happened when I actually, you know, shows you how long I was able to delay things because that actually happened when I was 17 or 16 going on 17. And it was not a, an ostensibly Christian poet. I had um, I had been brought up in a Christian faith and then at about 14 I had very fully, as I thought, and thoroughly overthrown it. And I'd become the exact opposite. I'd become, I, I was, I'd uh, become... I mean, I'm so, sorry to say I was a rather precocious little kid and I sat there reading, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre on the one hand and mm. B.F. Skinner on the other in my <laughs> sort of teens, you know. So I convinced myself that I was a materialist existentialist. So I had, I had a completely Skinnerian kind of behaviorist account of everything and then a, a sort of, you know, sense of existential angst. Uh, it's really awful. But anyway, that's the way mm. I... So I thought I had a very reductive account of everything. And I was always trying to figure out what chemical reaction corresponded with the thing I mistook for an insight, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was taken by an aunt of mine to Keats's house mm. when I was mm. late at 16. And I'm, I confess, you know, in spite of the fact that my mother had filled me in my childhood with wonderful poetry, and but never saying who the poets were, I didn't know anything about Keats. And I, I, you know, I really thought he was some sort of boring old fart. You know, <laughs> I, I was on a holiday from school, but I couldn't go back home. So I, my aunt was looking after me, and I, the last thing I wanted to be is to be dragged to some improving place. But of course, we got to Keats's house on Hampstead Heath, and as soon as you were there, you realised he was a very young man. You know, he was in love with the girl next door, but he, mm. you know, he can, he was dying. But, and then it so happened that the Ode to a Nightingale was up on the wall. And mm. this was in the room where you could look through mm. the French windows out to the tree in the garden where that April, you know, the nightingale mm. had sung. And so um, I read this poem on the wall because I had nothing else to do. And you may remember, you know, the beginning, 
of that, you know, my heart aches and a drowsy Drowsy numbness numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains. One minute passed and Lethe Woods had sunk. So you can imagine moody teenager, like Mm -hmm. ache, dull, drunk, sunk, Lethe drains. It's a very unpromising start to a poem, mm. actually. Mm-hmm. But he had me because that was, you know, and I thought, oh, yeah, I know you. No, no, I feel, mate. You know. And then, of course, suddenly and unexpectedly, the poem lifts. He hears the bird, you know. And it, when he gets to that bit that says, um, "'Tis not through envy of thy happiness, but being too happy in thy happy lot, that this was, these were the lines, that thou, Light winged dryad of the trees, mm. in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in a full throated ease. Mm. And that melodious plot of beech and green mm. and sh- and then of course it goes on, you know, when he goes out into the into the garden and it's dark, you know, I cannot tell what flowers are at my feet or what soft incense hangs upon the boughs, but in embalmed darkness guess mm. each sweet. I was just completely I, I had no idea that English could sound like that. Mm. Mm. I had just no idea and something in me just completely woke up to the sheer beauty of that. So then I was reading on and you get to this extraordinary bit. It's a very strange transition in the poem where he's got the, you know, Ruth standing sick for home in tears amidst the mm-hmm. alien corn, you know. And then he suddenly, he's her, he imagines the nightingale singing to Ruth in her exile. I felt very exiled. I was much more homesick than I would allow myself to admit, you know, being in England and my parents' home. Can, so I, that, that bit is, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, Keats produces that image of the windows, doesn't he? Yes. Which magic. have charmed op- magic casements on perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. Now, that image that somehow at the back of the poem, there are these magic casements opening and there are perilous seas. That, that was a complete epiphany. I mean, uh, and I just wanted more of that. And I felt from that day to this that there are, in, in a certain kind and quality of poetry, at the, at the back of almost every poem, there are magic casements that could mm. open if you would only let them onto that other thing. So that became, I, I walked into the house a pure materialist and I mm. walked out of the house, <laughs> if you like, an idealist or something. I, I, I said to myself, I don't care how complicated the neurons are or how many of them are firing or what kind of, you know, that experience I had with that poem doesn't arise from a mere concatenation of bits of dust in empty space. Something happened there mm for which the material stratum that allowed it to take place cannot give a full account. You know, it's something, there is a moreness there. So at that point, I realized that I couldn't completely rule out some kind of spiritual realm, but I saw it as a, as a kind of panpsychic spiritual reality in and through behind. Of course, I then went on to read Wordsworth and, you know, I mm. found my way, Shelley, found my way around all the romantics. So I had a, a sort of, romantic pantheism going for a while but it was a lot better it was a lot better to be a romantic pantheist than a bf skinner materialist right right you know so that was a preparatio evangelio if, if you like and then i needed to know that you know that there was a person that actually on the other side of the of the the magic casements was not only perilous seas but a kind of perilous call mm. Mm. you know I heard BF just, Skinner, oh. excuse me. I heard BF Skinner speak in college, and the two really? things that oh. struck me: yes, he came to Westmont. He was the sort of the kind of Richard Dawkins of his day. He was. Yes. He yes. was kind of, and yeah, yeah. For for those who might not know him on, on this podcast, I mean, he was kind of Dawkins of his day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's famous for behaviorism. My yeah. two impressions were he had mismatched socks, which mm. didn't make a good impression, mm. and the the question about consciousness seemed to really baffle him. The whole yeah. idea of behaviorism is everything can be measured and empirical. Yeah, exactly. And mm. you would have thought he would have thought more about consciousness, but someone well, said, how do you know someone's faking pain or actually in pain? And he seemed a little bit perplexed by what seemed to me like an obvious question. Yeah, no, he doesn't have... In fact, there is no account of consciousness in that. Materialism itself mm-hmm. is incapable of producing an account of consciousness. I've just finished writing a fairly sort of big book about Coleridge and going deeply into Coleridge's understanding of, of these things. And... That was precisely the problem for Coleridge. And there's a note, there's a, Coleridge's best thought is in his marginalia. And mm. there's a note, I think it's in his marginalia to Spinoza, um, where Coleridge basically says, 
there are really only two statements that you can begin with. You can either start with it is or you can start with I am. Mm -hmm. And if you start with it is, you're, you have an immense difficulty in ever accounting for any kind of I amness. Mm. And since your experience of I amness is much more direct, it's less mediated than any knowledge you have of what it is, you, it's much better to start with I am as a given and try and figure out if you can get to it is, if you can actually have mm. enough. And, of course, then Coleridge realizes that I am is the name of God. And, you know, the great I am is what Yahweh means. So then you, in Coleridge, you get this wonderful where he calls him the infinite and the adorable I am. You know, he always wants to call him I am because he sees the consciousness of God as founding every other consciousness. Mm. And then the creativity of God is giving grounds for the, the it isness of other things. Mm. But he felt his whole age was getting it completely the wrong way around, as ours is that it was trying to start with a material account of things, the kind of Locke and Hume and Newton, you know, Descartes, Newton, Locke, Voltaire, Hume, Voltaire right. you know. Um, and it's interesting that Coleridge was coming to those conclusions at the same time that Blake was coming to those conclusions. But, and they met. But we, unfortunately, they finally met in, like, 1816, um, when nobody knew who Blake was, but everybody knew mm. who Coleridge was. But um, they were introduced by a, a Swedenborgian called Alexander Tulk. And he says, oh, it was so good to be with them. It was like two angelic intelligences momentarily speaking on our planet, stepping on our planet. But then he doesn't tell you what they said. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been, my, one of the projects I'm working on at the moment is, as it were, to try and reconstruct an imaginary conversation mm. between Coleridge and Blake. Mm. <laughs> is this the book you just mentioned? Yeah, so the book I, well, the book I, I, I didn't, I don't have that as an episode. So the book I was mentioning is a book called Mariner, a Voyage mm. with Samuel Taylor Coleridge, mm. which is an attempt um, really to, to re-establish the centrality of Christ and of Trinitarian thinking in a full understanding of Coleridge and of Coleridge's mm. own reading of his life because Coleridge's faith has been sort of airbrushed out of almost every secular right. account of him and mm. it's like it's background religious noise, you know, 19th mm. century religious mm. tune. It's somewhat like so, this... Um, um, this celebration of Tolkien that was at uh, Oxford. The body, and I went to yes. see that, yeah. And they and just they quietly left back, his Christianity yeah, 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 out. Yeah, exactly. So these things need need restoring and recovering. Um, and it's also a fresh, the book is also a fresh reading of the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner for our own day and, you know, both mm -hmm. from the ecological and sort of philosophical aspects of it. Um, it was a joy to write, but it was, it was a labor of love, but it... it uh, it's, it's, I know that C.S. Lewis really enjoyed Wordsworth. Does he have anything to say about Coleridge? He he does. Um he certainly enjoyed enjoyed Wordsworth and um but he was a deep reader of Coleridge. Uh, in fact, while I'm here at the Wade, I've just been doing this morning, I'm going to be carrying on later. I've been looking at um Lewis's own copy of um the Biographia Literaria, which mm. you have in the collection here, and just looking at the notes and underlinings, and they're very extensive. And it's a copy that he had from being quite a young man. So this is the Everyman nineteen seventeen edition, and he would have acquired that, you know, uh more or less as soon as it came out. So we can go right back into very early Lewis. The Lewis is just coming up to Oxford, you know, after the war. Um and uh interestingly it's 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 as much the philosophical passages as the literary critical passages that he he underlines. Mm. I'm going to be going on later while I'm here to to look at his copies of uh, Coleridge's Table Talk as well. And, mm. uh, so I, I knew that Coleridge is important for him. I mean, Coleridge is important for him directly, but I think there's an even more indirect influence, partly because Coleridge is absolutely essential to George MacDonald. George MacDonald's mm. whole sense that, mm. that the imagination was trustworthy and that it was in some sense a truth-bearing faculty comes from his reading of Coleridge's defence and theology of the imagination. So MacDonald has, lot, has le lectured on Coleridge. MacDonald specifically lectured on the rhyme of the ancient mariner. Mm and drew great things out of it. So there's that. And then, of course, the other person who's channeling Coleridge to, to, to Lewis the whole time is Owen Barfield, who's mm, deeply, right. deeply Coleridgean. I mean, it was after Lewis's death that, that uh, Barfield wrote What Coleridge Thought, which is one of the books that, that sent me to Coleridge with a fresh mm. and more serious mm. approach. Um, so I think... Um, Lewis was was pretty fully versed in in Coleridge. He Isn't the term coherence that Williams uses? Isn't that from Coleridge as well? Well, 
That's my well, understanding. It is. It's from yeah. Coleridge. Coleridge, Coleridge. Coleridge was a great not only inventor of neologisms. I mean, Coleridge. It's from Coleridge. We get subconscious, unconscious. Coleridge mm. is the first person to use the words, the phrase "point of view" as a metaphor. Mm. But previous, it was a point you went to to have a special picturesque oh, view. Mm. And he said, "Well, you you know, everything depends on which point of view you're standing at." But um, yeah, coherence is Coleridge began to read and reread Trinitarian theology from about 1805 onwards to try and get his mind around it. So Coleridge, I think, borrowed that term from the way. Uh, the fathers, I think the Cappadocian fathers talked about the indwelling of the Father in the Son and the Son and the Father Spirit. And then, and I think Coleridge continued to use that in those fairly Trinitarian ways. And then Williams, Williams' moment of genius was to say, well, no, it's not just the way the Trinity, it's not just a Trinitarian term because we're made in the image of God. We also co in here with each other mm -hmm. and indwell in one another and that that you then get the whole Williams, you know, um, sort of nexus of coherence, substitution and exchange as mm. central to the way of seeing mm. things. I had a student who was doing a study of Williams and he said, I just love the idea of incoherence. I think it's so wonderful <laughs> yeah, that we yeah. can study incoherence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go back and have another look before yeah, you write yeah, your yeah. paper. But I do actually like the way coherence is a kind of redemption of incoherence. I mean, you know. That's true. Right. Yeah, it's, what we need is not, it's not incoherence to coherence. Right. What we need is incoherence through coherence to coherence. Right. So actually right. there is some, some play to be made there. And if I remember correctly, I think Coleridge coined the term interaction. He may well have done. I'm, I couldn't give you chapter and verse on that, but that w it wouldn't surprise me in the mm. least. Um, now, here's the thing. Some of Coleridge's coinages, um, you know, point of view, interaction, subconscious, unconscious, have sort of really made the mainstream. Um, but some of the ones that he thought were really important, like sadly, no. so the, the classic one would be esimplastic, which right, is that's the right. word that he begins. I mean, it was a tragedy for the romantics that that plastic was invented as a substance because oh. they loved the word plastic in the sense of plasticity and in the sense of, of a kind of moldability of form. And, you know, I mean, there's a bit where, where um, Cole, uh, Shelley talks about there's something, something spirit, plastic and vast. And of course, mm. now we just see, we just see. Right unbiodegradable plastic bottles. <laughs> right. So that Destroying word's, our environment. That word's been right. destroyed. But the reason why I mention as in plastic is I think it's quite an interesting word as well, but I've never seen anybody at, at Coleridge use it until I was reading the O oh Hell volume, the, the Lewis's uh, um, uh, literature in the 16th century excluding drama, that snappy little title. <laughs> um, and Lewis uses as in plastic. In that, and mm. I'm sure it's a deliberate nod, let the reader understand, as it were, to, not only to Coleridge, but to Coleridge fans out there, which is a way of saying, look, I'm channeling Coleridge. And in his appreciations of Shakespeare, Lewis certainly follows Coleridgean readings of Shakespeare. Mm. We'll be expecting a poem which uses that word from you. Sometime. Yeah, yes, yes, in plastic. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty. Rhymes with supercalifragilistic. Uh, Expialidocious, yes. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I want to know when you first discovered Lewis. Now, one of the things you said was that you rediscovered him. Had you read him as a child? Yes, I had, yeah. And then you mentioned it was prefa the yeah. preface yeah, to yeah. Paradise so, Lost. And what is it that really grabbed yeah. your attention? Yeah, I had sort of three goes at Lewis, which is rather fun. I, I started with the Narnia books. Um, I'm not sure that they were read to me. I think I... I um, you know, started reading fairly young, and I think my sister had, had uh, you know, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and so I got that. And I absolutely loved it and read it again and again and, um, and then eagerly, you know, asked for the other ones, you know, for presents and for Christmas. And um, I love the Pauline Baines illustrations mm. as well. For me, that's kind of almost inseparable. Um, and so I was reading those as a little kid in Africa, and then I think I'd got to, probably by the time I was, you know, nine or ten, I'd, 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 I'd certainly got to The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which is was then and remains my favourite of all of the, mm -hmm. the Narnia books, partly because I love boats and the sea. Yeah. We'd spent a lot of time. At, when I was in Africa, we used to come back every year by ship mm. to England. Well, my dad would fly ahead, but my mum wouldn't fly, so my sister and my mother and I would come by sea, and I loved being at sea and on board ship, as we said. So uh, a sailing book from Lewis was just a double bonus. Um, 
But I remember being very excited because eventually we left. We'd been in Nigeria. We went to Zimbabwe, or Rhodesia as it was then. My father was very much opposed to the Smith regime, which was trying to turn it into apartheid. And as you may mm. remember, a bit of history, they declared in, there was a, a, a an illegal declaration of independence from England in order to, because the English, the fact that it was a, a crown colony meant that they couldn't enact racist laws because English law ran. So there was a unilateral declaration of independence. And my father at that point regarded his obligation of obedience to the government as over because it was no longer a lawfully constituted government. Mm. But I mean, he was a pacifist, you know, he wasn't, he didn't, but he was just trying to sort of resist. And he resigned from his post in the university because um, the university was trying to, the government was interfering in university affairs. Anyway, the end result was that we were expelled from the country mm. and um, left everything. And a lot of, we were actually political refugees. And Dad's old college in Cambridge, St. Catherine's, kindly took him in. So in all this bustle and commotion and distress from my parents, the one thing I remember as being a piece of good news out of all this chaos was the word Cambridge. And the word Cambridge was important to me, not because I knew anything about a university or, or ever guessed that most of the rest of my life would be spent there, but was simply because that's where Eustace Scrubs' house was. <laughs> and there was a picture somewhere in Cambridge. There was a painting on a wall that could get you to Narnia. <laughs> you know, I had no idea where the wardrobe was, but, you know, I was just very excited to come to Cambridge because I, I know, and when I think of, you know, I've got a little passage at the end of my book on um, on Coleridge, the Mariner book, about the reception of the rhyme of the ancient Mariner and the, the huge creative impetus it gave to so many other writers. And, of course, I've got a bit about Lewis, and Lewis's real tribute to Coleridge is the rhyme of the ancient mariner, which is, is sorry, is, is the word of the dawn treader, which of course starts with, you know, Coleridge's line, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Uh -huh. So that starts with a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Mm. And then you have mm. the whole episode of b a good imagination or a bad one and the, the die island we dream, the nightmare life and death, you, they say mm. to the nightmare mm. island. And it's the one place where Aslan is manifest as, as anything other than a lion or a lamb. Because when the seagull comes down, mm -hmm. when, the sea, when, when the albatross, when the albatross comes down along the beam, and says, courage to your heart, to Lucy, it's Aslan's voice. So that offers an entire reading, a Christocentric mm. reading of the rhyme of the ancient mariner, in which the albatross is the Christ figure, which it is. In fact, Coleridge constantly links the albatross with the cross, you know, instead of the cross, the albatross, about my neck was mm -hmm. on. And, you know, by him that died on cross. I mean, it's as if it had been a Christian soul, we hailed it in God's name. And most secular readings ignore that. So my whole reading of the mariner uh, is is a Christian, Christocentric reading of the whole poem. And I just have this little note at the end say, that was clearly Lewis's reading too. Mm -hmm. And that's all in there. So, um, yeah, so Voyage of the Dawn Treader was very important to me as a kid and remains so. So I read all those Narnia books f between the ages of probably about 7 and 11 or 12, just kept rereading them. And then I gave it no further thought until... You know, and then when I became an atheist, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't, you know, I wasn't reading children's books. I was, I was like used to scrub, you know, I was just desperately trying to be grown up, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and, uh, you know, it was a very good school. So there were some other bright kids there as well. But frankly, you know, I was going around at the age of 14 with a head full of Sartre and Beckett and <laughs> Skinner. Mm -hmm. Like I almost had nobody to talk to uh, about that stuff, uh, you know, but, um, then um, I had this Keats epiphany. So I immediately just started reading, you know, I suddenly switched from wanting to do sciences to wanting to do the arts. I soaked myself in mm. all the romantics, so I got Keats and Shelley, obviously Shelley was next, and then Coleridge and then Wordsworth and then Byron. And um, so I was getting that whole romantic thing. So I studied English. Uh, and of course, English, you can't just do the romantics, you know, so we were doing Milton. So, uh, I saw there was a book by, called Preface to Paradise Lost by C.S. Lewis, and I remember the name of those those mm. enchanting story stories. And um, I read I read uh, Preface to Paradise Lost as part of my A level work in you know the mm. end of high school. I was just blown away by the lucidity and the clarity of it, and the whole account of poetry in it. Um, and um, 
we read, we also read Comus and Lycidas, and I loved, I just loved Comus. And I then realised, wait a minute, this is a story in which kind of some children get lost in a word and meet various magical mm. characters who all have huge Christian resonance. Mm. Where have I heard this before? You know, and uh, so that made me begin to think, oh, maybe there was more to those stories mm -hmm. that than met the eye. Um, so Lewis then I began to trust as a literary critic. And there's a set of his essays, I think it's called Rehabilitations. By this time, I was deeply, deeply into Shelley as a thinker as well. As, and I realised that this was not kosher, that the whole movement, you know, Eliot and beyond, had reacted against the romantics mm -hmm. and that Shelley was being dismissed as adolescent. And um, then I read in Rehabilitations a defence of Shelley mm. by Lewis. And I thought, like, Lewis is now my friend forever because he's mm. defending Shelley against Eliot. Mm. And uh, I still would maintain Lewis's defense of Shelley and, mm. you know, and Shelley's Despite defense of Despite Shelley writing The Necessity of Atheism? Oh, absolutely. Well, it's my kind of atheist. I mean, oh. uh, yeah. I mean, The Necessity of Atheism, of course, was a deliberate rebuke because everybody had to write this little treatise on the 39 articles, which they didn't believe. So, mm. But I've now come to read... I mean, it's interesting... I would say that Shelley's greatest achievement is, is the Ode to the West Wind. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, I mean, it's, it's impossible not to read that as almost without his realising it, uh, a, a hymn to the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's entirely, mm -hmm. it's just full of great, mm -hmm. great uh, theology of the Spirit. Um, so he was an atheist in this, he was not a materialist atheist, clearly. You know, he right. he certainly you know the one remains the many change and pass. You know, I mean, he was he was possibly a pantheist, but he he was so outraged, as was the young Coleridge, by the the grossness of the established church at that mm -hmm. time. It's utter compromise in the slave trade. I mean, apart from the mm. noble example of Wilberforce, it's resistance to any reform. It's complicity in the exploitation of the poor and the weak, you know. And the French Revolution had just challenged all of that. And and um, I think for Shelley, he couldn't distinguish the, the which, as Lutz Coleridge later did, the actual gospel in its glory and purity from the particular cultural manifestation of the language of Christianity in the mouths of a, of a, of a completely... Um, compromised and worldly bench of bishops, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that he, you know, it wasn't even an option for somebody of Shelley's purity and fiery spirit to consider the Christianity of his day. Mm -hmm. um, it happens a lot. People tend to throw out the babe with the bath. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they can't yeah. separate uh, um, biblical Christianity or the heart of Christianity but, from institutional. But forms. in fact, the the way she. Shelley's imagination eventually did, I think, come to be deeply fed by Christianity and the gospel was actually through Dante. It was when he went to Italy. Mm -hmm. you know, and his own poem, The Triumph of Life, is written in Terza Rima. And um, mm -hmm. I think he was a very close reader of Dante. And, of course, he, Shelley was a Platonist, you know, so he, you know, right. there's, a, there's a huge amount. Um, so I don't think um, Shelley would, um, certainly wouldn't, Count as an atheist today in anything like the mm. modern sense of that term. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was a huge admirer of Coleridge, and Coleridge's Biographia Literaria, which is a very Christian book, was mm -hmm. very important to to Shelley. And in fact, um, Shelley did make a pilgrimage to go and see Coleridge in the lakes, and Coleridge wasn't there. He was off on one of his jaunts. And um, he Coleridge, in a letter, says he deeply regretted not meeting Shelley because he thought he could have converted him. And that was not an idle boast because, of course, Shelley's formal re renunciation of, of Christianity, his formal atheism, came directly from William Godwin, the anarchist philosopher and author right. of an inquiry concerning political justice. I mean, Shelley you know, married Godwin's daughter. Right. Um, so Godwin was a friend of, of Coleridge's, and Coleridge did actually move Godwin from atheism through deism to theism. He didn't get him as far as Christianity. But Godwin, in his letters, writes about conversations with Coleridge as persuading him that he could no longer have an impersonal view of deity. So mm -hmm. actually, if Coleridge was capable of moving Shelley's own philosophical master that far, I would think he would have had no trouble moving Shelley in that mm. direction, but mm. tragically they never met. Mm-hmm.
everybody writes about Coleridge as a powerful conversationalist oh, because, yeah. of course, yeah. he gave up on poetry, and many theorists think it's because he felt, after hearing the intimations owed by Wordsworth, yeah. that there's no way he could write um, at that particular level. Yeah. But, as you say, because of that, we have his more philosophical yeah. works, and that may have allowed yeah. him to move towards... Yeah, and the philosophical art. works don't abandon the poetry. A lot of them reflect on... One of the things he was going to write and he never wrote, and it's one of the things we've lost, like there's so many lost works of Coleridge, but he was going to write a philosophical commentary on his own ancient mariner, and he never ceased mm. to reread and revise that. And, of course, what we do have, which I make a great deal of in my book, is the beautiful gloss, which he probably wrote as late as 1815. Right. You know, the gloss on the side, mm -hmm. which gives us, I think, a very strongly Christian reading of the poem, if we read the gloss mm. right. Um, yeah, it, there was a sense uh, in which he began to feel diminished in Wordsworth's words. And I think Wordsworth, to some degree, took quite a lot of advantage of Coleridge to kind of feed the mm. stuff that he needed for his poetry. And it was Wordsworth's decision to exclude Coleridge and specifically to exclude Christabel from the mm. um, second edition of the Lyrical Ballads that I think actually was a huge wound in Coleridge's self-confidence mm. as a poet. Mm. He did respond to the ode on, uh, on... Well, in fact, his parallel ode to the ode on intimations of, of immortality is Dejection and Ode, right. I mean, which is right. ostensibly a poem about losing inspiration, but it's it's got to be one of the most inspired right. poems about not having inspiration <laughs> you, know, you could ever possibly have, I mean, you mm. know. And and that's got that whole thing which of course Lewis feeds on, you know, about joy, about what you know, joy is that mm -hmm. spirit, is that luminous. I mean, I think the whole luminous cloud bit is borrowing partly from dejection. Mm -hmm. right? So um that's one of the finest things. And actually one of the finest things he wrote was a tribute to Wordsworth, was listening to his his poem about listening to the prelude. Mm -hmm. Um but he did shift effectively more in, into prose and um uh but everybody says that his conversation was better than his written prose. There's a great uh, anthology called Col a book called Coleridge the Talker, where a couple of scholars have just collated every account that there is by Coleridge's contemporaries of hearing him talk. Unfortunately, most of them say how how like it was listening to the Archangel Gabriel and how wonderful mm -hmm. and how his face and his figure was completely transformed by it now how uh, you yourself felt rekindled as he spoke. But they don't tell you what he talked about, mm -hmm. except for Keats. Keats has a fantastic thing about when he bumped into Coleridge on Hampstead Heath, and he lists, you know, mermaids, nightingales, all the different things. And, um, and of course, then Keats writes the ode to a nightingale shortly after having had a conversation with Coleridge about nightingales. So, um, uh, and Keats's La Belle Dame Sans Merci is also possibly uh, got some Coleridge in influences. So... Um, I mean, Shelley writes a great tribute to Coleridge in, in, in the letter to Maria Gisborne, the verse, mm. the verse letter, where, where he says, uh, he describes, compared with anybody else around him, he describes Coleridge in that poem as a hooded eagle amongst blinking owls. Mm. You know, mm. <laughs> if you could only take the hood off, you know, the power his parts. Yeah. And, you know, Charles Lamb famously said, uh, mm. you know, an archangel, a little damaged. Mm -hmm. come back from, mm -hmm. uh, there's a great story about about when he was writing Biographia and he was re re recalling the days when, as a young man, he'd candidated as a Unitarian preacher. Right. Uh, not because he was particularly Unitarian, but because the Unitarians were the only people he could see really working on the slave trade and he mm -hmm. feed his, mm -hmm. you know, and they loved to hear him preach. So he was looking back to those days and uh, he said to, he said to Lamb, he said, do you remember those days? He says, my dear Lamb, he says, uh, did you ever hear me preach? And Lamb said, my dear Coleridge, I never heard you do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned how C.S. Lewis's concept of joy can be, was informed by the romantic sense that there is something beyond the visible mm. world. Mm. And um, I'm wondering, you mentioned as well, Owen Barfield, how much his work shaped your understanding of Coleridge or do you take issue with some of um, his perceptions? Well, I had already sort of, I loved Coleridge the poet from the get-go. So very fortunately for me, my mother had recited large parts of the Ancient Mariner to me when I was a kid out at sea. So if we were out in a boat and just once we got out and the breeze was up, 
She would just automatically say, the fair breeze blew, the white foam flew, the furrow followed mm. free. You know, it was just the way it was. So I had that. And then, um, then in my first exploration of the Romantics, I went to Coleridge and, and uh, so Frost at Midnight and This Lime Tree Bow My Prison, uh, um, uh, poems like that, the, o the o Olean Harp. Mm. Then... As an undergraduate, I read the biographia and was puzzled by lots of it, but deeply intrigued, but couldn't really get my mind around it. And then at some point, probably in my late 20s or early 30s, I came across Owen Barfield's What Coleridge Thought. And I hadn't really been aware of the range and depth of his philosophical mm. reading. Now, that is a hard book to read. It is. It's extremely dense. It requires a lot of you. But I found it very exciting. and. Um, it sent me back. I then read Richard, the first volume of Richard Holmes's uh, two-volume biography of Coleridge, um, Coleridge Early Visions. In fact, the second one hadn't been written at that point. I mean, there was a long gap between those two books. So I read, I read Barfield, and I was very excited by the attention Barfield drew to Coleridge's link between the imagination as a faculty of perception mm. and and the the logos uh, and the word the logos in us and beyond us and as you know he finally comes up with that astonishing definition where he says uh, the primary imagination is the living power and prime agent of all mm. human perception and is a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. So he's saying every act of human perception is not only imaginative, but it is an imagination which participates in and re repeats the actual act of creation by God happening all the time because it's eternal, it's outside time, and therefore every moment of time is just as close to it. You know. mm. And that link between every perception and the log, that excited me enormously. And, of course, it's something that, that Barfield follows up. So I was determined to find more about it. And the other exciting thing that Barfield, you know, was the first place I learned this, was that Coleridge had an unwritten book that he intended uh, to give the world, which was going to be called Logos Sophia, so mm. Logos Wisdom, mm. and that this would have involved a commentary both on the Gospel of St. John on the one hand and the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner on the other. Mm. So that sense mm. that there was something linking John and the prologue to John with what happens in the, the working of the poetic imagination, that became something that I really wanted to explore. Mm. And both the chapter... The sort of as a fairly central chapter on Coleridge in my book, Faith, Hope and Poetry, Theology of the Poetic Imagination, where I was trying to articulate a theology of imagination and gradually realised uh, that actually Coleridge had done it for me. Mm. And I just needed to show the relevance of that to the debates mm. we're having now. Mm. So my, I wanted to go on from Barfield, as it were, in my own mind at least, if not on paper, to reconstruct this lost Coleridgean work that linked the uh, the prologue to John mm. on the one hand and the Roman ancient Mariner on the other. And that's what I've tried to do at greater length in my book, Mariner. Mm. I want to move on to your own poetry. Do you quote or explicitly allude to any of the seven authors here at the Wade in any of your poems yes i do both explicitly and sort of implicitly because sometimes you know they enter so deeply into your mind you know there there are things which mm. are, well first of all i i have a i have a sonnet specifically written to or for or about lewis oh which i composed uh, kind of around the time read it to thoughts. us so so and that that turns on let me read you that i have a section in my book the singing bowl called um clouds of witness and um amongst them those clouds of witness in fact in the layout i was quite careful about this my poem for coleridge and oh. my poem for lewis are on facing pages because mm. i see them as sort of twin stellar stars in my my in my um, night sky so here's the poem for c.s lewis from beer and beowulf to the seven heavens whose music you conduct from sphere to sphere, 
you are our portal to those hidden havens whence we return to bless our being here. Scribe of the Kingdom, keeper of the door which opens unto all we might have lost, ward of a word hoard in the deep heart's core, telling the tale of love from first to last, generous, capacious, open, free. Your wardrobe mind has furnished us with worlds through which to travel, whence we learn to see along the beam and to hear at last the heralds sounding their summons through the stars that sing, whose call at sunrise brings us to our king. Mm. 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 Are you so, allowed to have a pause on a podcast? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was, That's so, lovely. Um, There's a little bit of Yeats in there too, I yeah, believe. Yeah, there was a... So, yeah. you know, of course, he loved Yeats. And um, he has a little tribute to Yeats in Dimer. I know there's a... Fan, the, the figure of the magician in Dimer is very much based on Yeats. Um, mm. And uh, when when he discovered Yeats as a young man, I mean, when, when Lewis discovered Yeats, it's very interesting. It shows you how Lewis thought of himself as Irish because, of course, the divide between oh, North right. and South didn't even exist, you know, when he was growing up. So um, he writes to Arthur Greaves very excitedly, you know, from school. I've discovered that you must, you must discover there's an amazing poet called Yeats. And he gives <laughs> our mythology in the best possible way. Oh. That's our mythology. Wow. So, um, yeah, so I wanted to touch on Yeats. I wrote a poem. It's interesting how you sometimes somehow... Um, uh, yeah, I think this is actually also in, in The Singing Well. You draw on something from Lewis and it just comes to you at the end and you realise, oh, no, I need Lewis for that. I can't... Nothing else will do. So um, I I wrote a poem about... about um, watching the sunset which is which is very much in in the whole tradition i mean uh, of uh well good friday 1613 riding westward mm. i'm looking to the west but i need to think about the sun rising in the east i should mm -hmm. be facing jerusalem shame is he and knew. isn't um uh, words were surprised by joy yeah, about a exactly. sunrise exactly mm -hmm. and also um you got there's a great there's a great um Seamus Heaney poem called Westering, which is itself a tribute to, which is about going to California on Good Friday and traveling through through Ireland and going west when he's trying to think about, about mm. the east. Um, but I I suddenly re I realized that, that um, I'd been giving a series of talks at some point about, about sacred space and I was trying to talk about church architecture and the significance of the fact that um, they face east churches mm. and that the font is at the west door and how the whole thing John Donne him to God my God in my sickness you know where you had the whole idea that that the the the, the cliched idea in Kronos that east is the morning you know I you know our youth is the morning of our of our of our lives and then the noonday is our thing and, and you know we're all heading for some dreadful retirement home called sunset view you know, <laughs> all just, you know that that's the way the world works um and we're our declining west that we 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 naturally map the expanse of a human life onto a day in that way um so the point about the font being in the West, the font is a, a baptism into the death of Christ, that although chronologically we're all Westering, um, and, you know, although our, but although our outer nature is wasting away every day, mm. i.e. Westering, our inner nature is being renewed every day after the image of Christ. So we're actually moving towards, we are all of us actually moving towards a dawn in the sense of the, you know, the day of resurrection mm. and the last day. So we get our dying over in the West of declination at the, at the, at the front. And then in life, we're moving in our Christian life towards a dawn in the East. Mm. So I suddenly realized that the genius, the absolute genius mm. of Lewis in writing the voyage of the dawn treader, where he's channeling all this, you know, the Navigatio Brendani, which is obviously in there, the whole the voyage of, Brendan, which is westward, mm. you know, the garden of the gardens of the Hesperides, which is westward, you know, probably a bit of John Macefield in there that my mother used to quote to me as a, mm. you know, out beyond the sunset, could I but find the way is a sleepy blue laguna that widens to a bay and there's the blessed city or so the sailors say the golden city of St. Mary, it's all westward. But the genius of Lewis is to say, no, we're, we are spiritually sailing east. 
We're getting closer. Now is our salvation nearer than it was when we first began. We're getting closer to this sunrise. So I'd always have had that in the background. And then I wrote, I wrote this sonnet about looking at the sunset, which is just my attempt to join that conversation and about westering and decline. And, you know, maybe it's the time of year in, in me that I was, you know, whatever. So, and I suddenly mm -hmm. realized that only Lewis would do for the end. So I'll read you this. This is a sonnet called Westward. Um, Malcolm, can I adjust your microphone just a little bit? Yeah, sure. I'm just going to bring it down. Oh, yeah, yeah, because I look down. Yeah, yeah. So this is... This is about looking, watching the sunset. Um, every, everybody, everybody has to have a sunset poem, you know. Uh, <laughs> so this is my one's called Westward. We're looking west to where our setting sun, already out of sight, looks back at us to fling his dying splendour to these clouds. They burn with borrowed gold and crimson, not their own, like strips of silk torn from his royal robe, these flags of hope left by our solar king who sinks for us below the dark horizon that he might yet encompass all this globe. He leaves us with the promise of his rising, for all we face the west of his decline, already somewhere else, our voices praising as on the east they glimpse a kindled line. His setting is a herald of the morn. We watch the sunset, but we tread the dawn. Oh, mm. nice. Mm. So yeah. That is a lovely way to bring this podcast to a close, the sunset of mm -hmm. our conversation, which I assume will be the dawn of many more in the future. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Geit. Thank you.